This is the story of a safari, a champagne safari, a journey through splendor and savagery in remote places. Our hosts were His Serene Highness, the Prince Ali Soleiman Khan, and the former Princess Rahamat Banu Ali Khan, now once again simply Rita Hayward. I'm Jackson Leiter. I took these pictures. This is my friend Lola Leiter, Jack's wife. We travel by truck, plane, rickshaw, Rolls Royce, Falooka, station wagon, Jeep, and Jaguar. Ours was a fabulous journey, an adventure in city and in jungle amid ancient settings and modern ones in far off countries. Adventure it was from the moment we arrived in Pompeii. From California, we were summoned to Italy. By an invitation to glamour. The invitation came from an old friend, an American girl who had lived next door in Hollywood. We came from that noisy, hustling world where she had been queen of make-believe to this hushed antique land where she had become a real princess, the star of one of the great Cinderella stories of our time. For over two years, we had seen little of Rita. Newspapers told all sorts of stories after her glittering wedding on the French Riviera to Prince Ali Khan. Reporters and photographers trailed her even down these 2,000-year-old streets looking for tomorrow's headlines. Rita had none for them this time, and soon they ran out of questions and left us to see the sights. Pompeii is worth seeing. When mighty Vesuvius erupted back in 79 AD and covered the city with volcanic ash and lava, it preserved for us even the scribblings on its walls, like uh, Caius loves Tulia. <laughs> or Marcus Cicero is a dirty so-and-so. But after so long a separation, we were more interested in Rita than ruins. We found it as exciting to be with her again as our guide did. Like him, we kept one eye on the scenery, the other on her. I had known the struggling young actress, the starlet, and then the glamour queen. Pompeii was a good spot to get reacquainted. The old Romans had dedicated the city to Venus, the goddess of love. And Rita was America's choice as love goddess of the 20th century. She had always been eager, hardworking, friendly. Unlike some, Hollywood's success hadn't changed her much. But two years of the life of a princess in Europe? We wondered. Beautiful as ever. With Rita, even the oldest photographers get that certain gleam in their eye. <laughs> it goes with Pompeii. The city was the playground of ancient Rome. Wild, wide open, a city of luxury. The guide told about the two theaters that once stood here. The lovely actresses who were the toast of old Pompeii were wooed in this forum. And while she looked around at the rubbled remnants of its ancient glory, we watched Rita for signs of change. There were none. The princess was the same girl I'd always known. A little more saucy. But as warm and loyal a friend as anyone could want. Europe did bring out the tourist in Rita. When we paused in Athens on our way to join Prince Ali, she led us all the way up the hill to the Acropolis. She had to see every statue, every stone. Monuments, thank heaven, don't move when you photograph them. I had one of the world's loveliest models, but as you know by now, I'm not a professional photographer. But here was the chance of a lifetime. Rita was going to remote countries to meet her husband's people for the first time. A strain on any bride. Bring your camera, Prince Ali told me. Imagine Rita's loveliness amid world-famed masterworks of art, like these towering sculptured pillars of the Temple of Maidens. You can guess how pleased I was to record these scenes. 
Prince Ali thought the company of old friends would ease the strain of Rita's journey to far off places. Everywhere we find her fans, the younger ones tag right along with her. In the Parthenon, where the ancient Greeks worshipped the goddess Athene, by startling coincidence, Rita found a familiar face. The resemblance to Orson Welles was uncanny, as though the old Greek sculptor had foreseen him in the role of Macbeth. But now Rita was the Princess Ali Khan, impatient to rejoin her prince. Pausing to shake hands with the guard, who had recognized not the princess, but the movie star, we said goodbye to Europe and headed for Africa, where the movie star was just a celebrity, but the princess was worshipped. In Egypt, Rita started her sightseeing early in the morning. Prince Ali's ancestors for centuries ruled here as caliphs, but to Rita, he was just another tourist. She hauled him off with us to see the tombs of the pharaohs. The prince scoffed at our sun helmets and went bareheaded through the heat of the day. The princess said she preferred comfort to glamour. You can afford to say it when you combine both. Even with my photography, Rita couldn't take a bad picture. Sailing down the Nile in an Arab felucca on our way to the Valley of Kings and the lost grandeur of Thebes, we left civilization behind. The Nile cradled Western civilization and religion, but somewhere along the way, progress passed it by. Its people have not kept pace with the centuries. These buildings were ancient when Alexander the Great sailed down here to loot them. Some date back almost 7,000 years. A famed Egyptologist, Dr. Lubitsch, was our guide. But Rita's presence drew additional volunteers like flies. Everyone wanted to meet the beautiful movie queen. We learned from them how the pharaohs were mostly concerned in life with how they would live after death. They built great tombs, furnished them with food and household equipment so their ghosts could live in luxury. On the bodies of lions, they had their own faces sculptured, symbols of their power. These sphinxes guarded tombs once packed with royal treasure. The pharaohs figured nothing too good for their ghosts. But tourists photographing the sights shifted their aim when they saw Rita and Ali. The prince ignored the cameras, but the princess stopped to pose at the foot of the idol Amon while Ali went on. Rita thought she was through with Hollywood movie making for good. Now she was having fun. Ali waited impatiently beside King Tut, but Rita was in no hurry. Lola enjoyed watching her relaxed and at ease. In Hollywood, posing before a camera meant hours of hard work. In a setting like this, she'd have had to wear Cleopatra's robes. <laughs> or a harem dancing girl's. Yes. Only when she became a princess could Rita afford to appear in public in blue jeans and a sweater. The nice girl down the block in any American town. From Egypt, Prince Ali led us deep into Africa, where his realm begins. This is Nairobi, capital of Kenya, a modern city whose suburbs are the jungle. Its world trade has transformed witch doctors into traffic cops, taken them from the jungle to enforce laws framed by Englishmen. This temple was decorated in honor of our arrival with the orange and green banners of the Aga Khan and his son. Not a movie palace, but a mosque, sacred to Allah and Mohammed. Here, Prince Ali, the 49th generation in direct line from Mohammed, is worshipped almost as a god. In his Nairobi home, life is a page out of the Arabian Nights. Servants, like genie, bow to his every command. Mahmoud, the major domo, keeps the staff busy the year round, preparing for the prince's annual two-week visit. Mahmoud IV made such excellent desserts, Ali took him all over Africa. Yes, until one night in Zanzibar, dessert was awful. Then he was sent home in disgrace. 
Mahmoud 16 was servant to Mahmoud 1. Ali's secretary, Mademoiselle Blesch, takes dictation in four languages. Mahmoud 6 had one great talent. He could serve pineapple juice without spilling it. As a movie star, Rita had thought herself wealthy, but never had she dreamed of a luxury like Prince Ali's. Until Nairobi, Princess was just her new first name. Now she learned what it meant to live like one. Lola wanted to see the real Africa. We got directions from a local gas station, borrowed one of the five cars in the garage of Ali's Nairobi home and a chauffeur to go with it, and started out. Just outside town, we were reminded that this was conquered country, and conquest can only be maintained by force. The British have tripled their garrison here since our visit. The Kikuyus seemed friendly. Our chauffeur, Mahmoud 9, persuaded them to pose. Grandpa had just traded a cow for a new bride. She reached the ripe old age of 17. They were civilized enough to demand tips, money to buy the meat that they had once hunted freely in the jungle. The old Africa in which they were at home is being wiped out. The white man's Africa as yet offers them no real place. Kikuyus no longer live in this open village. Today, they're behind barbed wire in detention camps or on distant reservations, guarded by tanks and machine guns. Once, Kikuyu seemed as innocent and harmless as these children. But too often today, Kikuyu means maw maw, a fanatic oath sworn in blood to burn and pillage and murder until Africa is black once more. Kikuyus can no longer carry spears now that even white women and children must carry pistols. To us, this Maasai warrior with the painted can for an earring seemed picturesque but harmless. We even joked about the way his clothing was air-conditioned. But a few months after we'd gone, this very marketplace was the site of one of the bloodiest Momo slaughters. The Momo killed not only whites, but natives who refused to cooperate with them. On our visit, we saw what you see, the kind of Garden of Eden atmosphere that has lured the white man from the cities of Europe with a promise of greater peace and plenty. And if nothing comes wrapped in cellophane, at least you can feel and smell and taste before you buy. Two native beauties. They don't forget modesty for long. Man and wife, he's the one without the necklaces. This market had its high-pressure salesman, too, the one with the feather in his hat. He peddled a guaranteed cure for snake bite, broken heart, housemaid's knee, and pink toothbrush. One medicine for all, and he had taken an overdose himself. Hemp, hashish, what we call marijuana. Too shy to pose until he got his tip. And then he really hammed it up. He wouldn't let us take the lens off him until we left to rush back to town for another colorful show in honor of Princess Rita. To Muslim women, Rita seemed like a princess right out of a fairy tale. These, dressed in their traditional saris, came to Ali's home to perform an ancient religious dance for her.
really discourage mingling of men and women in public, the women always dance alone. This song is a long hymn of praise to the prince and princess. Duty carried the prince and princess to Mombasa, British East Africa, once the headquarters of a Muslim empire founded on slave trading. Since those days, Muslims have held a good part of Africa's wealth. A big share of the Aga Khan's fabulous fortune goes back to his people in the form of modern schools. This technical college is operated by the Aga jointly with the British government. Young Muslims study here the latest methods in science, engineering, agriculture. These were waiting for a glimpse of their princess. Everywhere in Africa, Rita was escorted on formal inspections of the schools which the Aga Khan, her father-in-law, had established. And everywhere in Africa, only five minutes' drive from up-to-date universities like this one, we found jungle and primitive people. Within sight of this college, we were lucky enough to stumble on Wakamba tribesmen who still live much as their ancestors lived. Music and dancing are more natural to them than speech. They sing and play and dance for weddings and funerals, for rain and for clear skies, for war and for peace. Any native dance is also a prayer to the jungle gods. And a jitterbug session, too. The dance went on, but at nightfall we left to rest up before flying from Mombasa in the morning. Our departures were as ceremonious as our arrivals. Wherever we came and went in Africa, crowds gathered. Government officials and Muslim leaders brought formal greetings to the prince. 
Ali's people thronged to receive his blessing and to greet their princess. Always they brought her garlands of flowers. And always the Girl Scouts. They never miss. Ali's chief pilot, Captain Benny Benjamin, was a Royal Air Force veteran who had trained during the war in Pensacola, Florida. The Prince's private plane was custom fitted with built-in card tables. Captain Benny often joked about his promotion from RAF squadron leader to chauffeur for a flying bridge game. He was killed when this plane crashed not long ago. As soon as the plane doors were shut and the engine started, the bridge game would begin. The soldiers had to stand at attention until we were in the air. Rita always waved till the last moment. Because of the bridge game, we traveled in two planes. In Nairobi, Ali, one of the world's ranking bridge players, found four Muslim millionaires who thought they could play as good a game as he. So he had to charter a second plane for his aides, secretaries, and servants. Whenever he was dummy, Prince Ali, a World War II pilot, took over the controls himself. We flew up and down the continent, visiting all the important Ismaili communities. Ours was a royal procession, airborne. Hey, remember Tanganyika? Yes, thousands had gathered to welcome the prince and princess. Here in 1946, the Aga Khan's people gave him his weight in diamonds. In 1954, platinum. Many African scout troops are named for the Aga and Prince Ali. This orange and green banner is the Royal Khan flag. We had come ahead to photograph the arrival. But Ali's plane was over an hour late. At last it came. When it circled overhead, the band struck up. Down it came. And right up it went. But it circled, came in again. And went right back up. On the next pass, we noticed that the landing gear wasn't lowered. Had something gone wrong? No, this time it landed safely to our very great relief. Later, Captain Benny explained that Ali had ordered him not to land until he'd finished the Royal Bridge game. Prince and princess always got a royal welcome. It always happened, too, that Muslim dignitaries battled for the privilege of holding the royal umbrella over Ali's head to protect him from the sun. But no one thought to protect Rita. The men crowded around Ali, making their traditional attitude clear. Woman, any woman, is an inferior species. If Rita resented their attitude, though, it uh, certainly didn't show. And the Muslim women adored her. Rita quickly learned that a princess must make more personal appearances than a movie star. Kindergarten girls made her homesick for her own children, but I think she enjoyed visiting them most. And the scouts. Our standing joke was that we had come to Africa to see boy and girl scout troops. But there was a point to it. The Aga Khan, closely allied to the British, is one of the most powerful supporters of the Western countries in the turbulent East. Deeply aware how much their people have lagged behind European progress, Prince Ali and his father are doing their best to fire the younger generation with a new spirit. That's why the scout movement gets so much of their time and effort. East and West met in music for us one day. The magnificent new home Prince Ali built here was still under construction then. So we were guests of a prominent Ismaili at a seashore estate. Thanks to the British governor, Lord Twining, 
the Tanganyika police band came to serenade Rita. Its leader, a Sikh bandmaster, had been inspired in India by British regimental bands. He set up its equipment on the spacious lawn right on the ocean front. It was a beautiful day for an outdoor concert, except for the gusts of wind that puff puffed off the ocean, roaring into our sound equipment. Our host, handsome son Nick, is one of the few Indian lawyers in Africa. Indians, as well as Africans, are barred from local universities. We'd been told that this band was unusual. So I prepared to film and record the concert. I set up two cameras and a sound recorder and enlisted everybody's aid, including Rita and the British officer in charge. We were told that the band leader trained his men from scratch. First, he had to teach them how to read music, then how to play each instrument. A composer and arranger too, the Sikh bandmaster also put African folk tunes to Western martial music and also arranged Western music in Afro-Indian style. A remarkable musician, this man. We well, couldn't quite figure out in advance how his work would add up in sound, but listen for yourself. It's not thunder, just the wind blowing into our microphones. until Rita took a hand. She did it. Somehow she made the reel jump the track and the sound tape, yards and yards of it, rolled all over the garden. It twisted and tangled. It was like a ball of yarn that a kitten's played with. I had to draft everyone in sight to help straighten it out. Finally, we lined all the musicians up in a row, each holding on to the tape. And with the help of the British officer in charge, we managed to untangle it and then to roll it up again. It took us almost an hour. What they're holding is the music you've just heard.
From North Africa to the Philippines, 12 million Muslims of the Ismaili sect believe the Aga Khan is divine. Some Ismaili live today just as they lived in centuries gone by. Others are modern in thought as well as dress. All unite in paying homage to the Aga, his son, and their princess. Here in Zanzibar, even the Sultan paid tribute to Ali and his wife. Prince Ali's Zanzibar home is like a fairy tale castle in an enchanted garden. This is just one of the many estates Prince Ali owns throughout Europe and the East. It is one of the most lavish. All this and a private golf course, too. The golf course, by the way, Prince Ali has since given to the people of Zanzibar. Prince Ali has homes ranging from plush villas to luxurious palaces in Paris, Cannes, Deauville, three in Ireland. Where he breeds racehorses. And a dozen or so more scattered around Africa and Asia. Building schools and hospitals, scholarships for young Muslims, and other philanthropies have cost the Aga Khan untold fortunes. Yet he is probably still the richest man in the world. His son has many responsibilities too, and these Rita had to share. The president of a Muslim brotherhood was our guide and protector on a shopping tour. Zanzibar is the home of the most gorgeous hand embroidery with silver and gold thread the kind of work no machine can duplicate. With many weeks of work, he'll make a sari worth hundreds of dollars. <laughs> Mr. President said he knew where to get it wholesale, but Rita went right ahead anyway and bought out almost all of this man's stock. So Mr. President splurged and bought a mango at retail because he couldn't resist the salesmanship of this little fellow. On our way to an official ceremony, we paused at the city laundry. And ladies, in Zanzibar, it's the men who wash the clothes. Hmm. Crowds gathered long in advance wherever the prince and princess went, waiting patiently in the hot African sun. Remember that day at the graduation exercises of the Aga Khan School for Girls? Yes, it was around 108 degrees in the shade. But Rita and Allie couldn't disappoint the loyalty and devotion of the people who had defied the heat. By this time, Rita had picked up enough Swahili to get along, enough even for a short speech without too much effort. You know, it didn't matter what she said. They were too busy looking. That's right. And they loved it whenever, as happened here, Allie took a back seat and Rita was in the spotlight. I think Allie preferred it. The audience did. They sat all afternoon watching the princess award prizes. The best in spelling, in sewing, in arithmetic, hour after hour. Don't you think it must have been awfully hard on the little girls each waiting her turn in the hot sun? All dressed up in their new Sunday best, their faces scrub shiny. I'm sure they wouldn't have missed it for the world. And I know Rita felt that way, too. Hot and tiring as it was, she couldn't help feel thrilled by the excitement of the crowd. And even when it ended, the prince and princess didn't dash right off. Despite the crush, she and Allie stayed to have a word with everyone. But at times we felt we'd gone through so much of this, we, we just had to get away from it all. Yes, and this is about as far away as you can get. Baganda tribesmen among the wildest in the African bush. The fellow in the fedora with the pink ribbon is their king, called the Kabaka. 
We came as they were warming up for a Nagoma, which means literally ghosts of ancestors. The Baganda believe that in this dance, their ancestral ghosts come to life in their bodies. Baganda friendships take a strange form. A Baganda will cut his chest with a sharp knife, stain coffee beans with the blood. Those who chew the bloody beans are his blood brothers in life and death. once adorned a beast called the Kudu. The overcoat and the battered fedora are the king's royal robe and crown. The one with the hennaed hair is seven feet tall. Sometimes they get so frenzied in their dances they run amok. When that happens, they believe evil ghosts called Bazazi have seized their bodies. The kudu blower's voodoo is supposed to hoodoo them away. Didn't help this man, though. Bazazi, or on his own, he went berserk. Sometimes a whole village will go Bazazi during a Nagoma. Then it gets dangerous. <laughs> and when we heard that, we took off. We were ready for a taste of civilization again, and we got it in Madagascar. With a jaguar thrown in. We were guests of the government. The French rule this beautiful island. It's one of the garden spots of the world. There's gold in them thar hills, and platinum too, and Ismaili Muslims, Prince Ali's people, own quite a share of it. The French high commissioner put his best foot forward for the prince and princess. While Ali flew off to the distant Lorenzo Marquis on official business, everyone else had a vacation, including the prince's secretary and reader's maid, Suzanne. We did get to go out for some shopping. You don't go to a grocery store here. You go to a grocery umbrella. And under those umbrellas, you can buy anything from nylons to diamond necklaces. The American consul and his wife were our guides. These colorful fabrics were unlike anything we'd ever seen. They're woven from hemp and banana fiber. That pretty red seat looked inviting, but it couldn't hold us all. And this display of silks caught our eye. We bought bolts and bolts, and some of the dresses Rita wears these days were cut from them. The consul spoke of America's influence here. I thought he was going to show us more Boy Scouts. But these came by on their own for a look at the princess. The consul really meant these housing developments, ranch style. The kind you see from Long Island to the San Fernando Valley. Practical as they are, I somehow felt the American style didn't fit in with the countryside. 
as well as these picturesque French-style homes. Ranch styles seem to me to go with streamlined cars and super highways, not with this. Looking for jungle, I found water lilies instead. They covered this lake for miles. I wanted camera practice for the wild animal safari we were going on next, but all I found were peaceful scenes. Then in this pleasant river, I spotted beasts. First swimming pigs I ever saw. Back again in Kenya, we set off on safari in Prince Ali's usual grand style truckload after truckload of equipment, and an extra truck for three dozen native servants. Soon after plunging into the jungle, we spotted game. Then the country got so wild, the servants had to get out and carry the trucks. But we pushed on into the interior for three more days. Rita and Allie stayed behind. Rita said she would fly in with Allie after we had pitched camp, but I wondered. I thought we'd save gas this way. Our tanks were running low. Where do you get gas on the African plains? At the corner super service station, of course. No, no hot dogs or soda pop. This fellow has his hands full servicing all the safaris that come by. He was used to cameras, but not his cousin from the country. Our destination was the Maasai hunting reservation where the lion and the hippopotamus play. We had to reserve this camp weeks in advance. It took a full day for our porters to unload and set up camp. Prince Ali was a far-sighted man. He hadn't overlooked a thing. In the middle of the jungle, he had fixed us up with all the comforts of the Ritz. One truck carried a generator for lighting and refrigeration. We had to make trays and trays of ice cubes daily. How else in the jungle can you chill champagne? Prince Ali had brought a load of the very best champagne. Went awfully well with pâté de foie gras and guinea hen under glass. And for the caviar, there's always vodka. No wonder this fellow invited himself in. Late in the afternoon, the camp began to take shape. The porters found the tent poles that had been missing and suddenly remembered how to tie knots. The smell of cooking did it. Their chef had fixed up a delicacy for them. Goo. But what drew the lion cubs was the smell of fresh meat. One came right up and had a T-bone steak, very rare. Abdullah, our puppy mascot, tried to cut himself in but didn't get very far. This shy little cub had none, and he's a vegetarian. Abdullah, a civilized pup, didn't like the cub's table manners, or maybe he was just working up an appetite. This fellow had a big one, ate the peanuts and the shells. There's a lesson in etiquette. About this time, the natives finished setting up the tents, and we sent them out to make sure the landing field was ready for the prince and princess. No Hollywood troupe on location ever had anything on us. Each of the guests had his own suite. No private bath, perhaps, but a valet to look after each man. And our cook was trained in Paris. Ali timed the arrival perfectly, appearing just as the porters finished work on the landing strip. Our hunting car went out to meet the plane. We couldn't wait to see how Rita, the tourist, would take to sightseeing in the jungle. Lola, who had made the three-day trip by car with us, wondered how Rita would like living in a tent. But Allie was alone. It was no great surprise. 
For some time it had been clear that not all princes and princesses live happily ever after. Early the next day, we made plans for the hunt. White hunters like this one make jungle safaris their profession. They are all crack shots, iron nerved in the face of danger. Some can track game through the jungle as well as any native. Lola talked about shooting a lion, but when she found out they don't drop dead automatically when you pull the trigger, she decided to read a book instead. Allie's bridge partners demonstrated fine form and then went back to cards. Unlike Prince Allie, I'm no hunter. He's an expert marksman with a lot of big game experience. All I wanted to do was photograph the animals. It looked like a good day for both of us. We split into two parties. Allie was after buffalo, the most dangerous of all game. He took no beaters. Instead of lying in ambush while beaters chased one into the open, he planned to track his buffalo through the jungle. Risky, but more sporting. I mounted a camera on a truck. Not risky, but fun. For close shots, though, I did take a hand camera along, and right off I was lucky, catching this herd of impala antelope. The impala is the most graceful of all animals. and the world's champion broad and high jumper. He covers up to 30 feet with each spring, soars as high as 15 feet in the air, like a curving arrow. This variety of antelope is the impala's uncle, not good to eat, but fine for lion bait. You can tame a zebra, but not ride or work him. He has little strength and less stamina. Gambling on the green a little lopsidedly came this couple. And right behind them, a family group, Papa, Mama, and Junior. Note the bird on the back of this giraffe. He feeds on ticks and fleas and warns his host, too, of the approach of danger. Giraffes are vegetarians, but fierce fighters. They use their long necks and heads as clubs, and one kick from those long legs can break the back of a lion. Then we spotted a herd of hartbeest, and lurking in the grass, a lioness. When this one perked up, we decided to follow her. Ahead, vultures signaled that the lioness had caught the scent of a kill. Safe on the truck, we trailed her. What lured her was a 2,500-pound buffalo that Allie had shot. Unable to lift it, he had gone on for more. Elephants. These aren't the Asiatic variety you see in circuses and zoos, but the African type. Killers all. The rhinoceros is afraid of nothing, which is understandable. One night on the Mombasa-Nairobi railroad, a rhino charged the locomotive. He lost but it took three days to patch the locomotive. This affectionate fellow would love nothing more than to hug you and squeeze you, and then eat you. This is a python. I had to get off the truck for these shots. The hunters warned, just don't get between a crocodile and the water. I didn't. Most animals won't drink from a stream where crocodiles lurk.
There's only one who will smile at a crocodile, and that's this two-ton baby, the hippopotamus. Bulky as he is, the hippo can outrun a man. But he can't swan dive. The hippo feeds only after dark, and he eats all night. That enormous stomach holds six bushels of food. Huge and cavernous as his mouth is, to swallow that much takes the hippo all night. We left the animals in the late afternoon, getting back to camp long before Allie. He had got no more than the one buffalo which he had lost to the lioness. Our cups ran over that evening. Allie abandoned bridge, and we sat around listening to the hunters tell of the old Africa that was. Later, some lions dropped in for a sociable visit. They said hello, but we weren't anxious to exchange greetings. They made themselves useful, though, took care of the problem of garbage disposal. We'd been gone over three months. It was time to go home. Rita, lonesome for her children and not too happy in Africa, decided to come with us. As you know, she left Prince Ali behind in Africa. His efforts at reconciliation lasted over two years, but ultimately failed. Their parting was a friendly one. Afterward, Rita said they'd had two strikes against them from the very beginning. He was a Muslim prince, and she was an American career girl. They just didn't think in the same way. Planning to go back to the movies after a three-year absence, Rita was happy to find she still had fans among the younger generation. We came to Alexandria to board a ship for the long voyage home. Saying goodbye wasn't easy. The wheel had come full circle. When the prince and princess started on this journey, they planned it as a second honeymoon. She had bought that station wagon in Morocco in happier days when it all began. Now she was taking it home. Just as we were preparing to leave, Rita received a special invitation from King Farouk to visit him at his summer palace here in town. Farouk was still monarch then, and he considered his invitations as royal commands. Rita didn't. Her answer was a firm no. We rushed the loading and hurried on board ship. And there we felt the thrill that comes only when a journey's ended and you're going home. Rita couldn't wait for the loading to finish, and after a while, in the excitement, she forgot all about the king. She trotted out her camera for some last-minute snapshots. It'd be a long time before she'd see anything as colorful as this. And then we relaxed, talked about what we'd do in New York, in Chicago, in Los Angeles, where we'd shop, what we'd buy. And about eating a banana split again. It had been a long time since Rita had posed for cheesecake pictures. I told her she'd better practice. We settled back, talked about Hollywood while Lola worked away at the camera. We'd forgotten all about Farouk when suddenly passengers began shouting that he had come in a boat to see Rita off. We got up to look, and sure enough, there he was, his speedboat about 50 yards away. The king didn't need an interpreter to understand Rita's sign language. Farouk guessed he wasn't wanted and took off. Rita kidded about her lost opportunity to win Cleopatra's throne.
away from Africa, the women got sentimental again. Yes, we were all happy to be going home. 